And uh, I kind of apologize in advance. I've been studying this, uh, this, this thing that's, you know, and I'm trying to condense it down into three hours. I mean, 40 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the start is crucial. I mess up, mess up the start. I don't know where I go. But anyway, I'm not in my head at the moment. It's blank. So I apologize in advance for some, uh, for new people who might find this a bit uh, hard to understand. And for people who've been around for many years, it might find it hard to understand. But anyway, it's never a good time when I've got my big notepad. I usually have my little one and an iPad. <laughs> but anyway, let's start. So it's all about. Uh, the events that happened in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And I want to, you know, it, it all comes back to uh, Daniel's 70 weeks. For those who are not familiar, like Israel in the Old Testament, you know, they, they were chosen to be, to be God's, but they were the original church. Israel was the church. They called the church in the wilderness. And as they went on, God promised them blessing if they would obey him, cursings if they would disobey him. And the, the, the Israel split in two, and you had the ten tribes of Israel on one side, and you had the tribes, you had Judah on the other side. And the ten tribes just went full on into sin and uh, went into captivity. And well, basically, if you if you if you take uh, Think of it as a tree. They'll cut off the tree through unbelief. They'll cut off. So all you had left was, was Judah. And then as time went by, God said, they're no better. The just uh, called, called her the treacherous sister. And then we get to Daniel and we read the 70 weeks prophecy God revealed a, a prophecy that your people, therefore the Jews, have 70 weeks. And, you know, I won't go into it all, but so there's a time period where they had to get their act together or also be cut off from the tree. And that time period worked out. It, it, it said in the last week, the Messiah would come. He'd be cut off in the midst of the week. We know that's Jesus. All the things that were mentioned in there about introducing righteousness, cutting off animal sacrifice, so on and so forth, was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And I believe the 70 weeks was up with the stoning of Stephen. Because Stephen, it was a very unusual thing in the book of Acts. Stephen basically gives a summary of the entire Old Testament and how the Jews had stoned this prophet, and done this, done that, done this, done this. And... Uh, and now I see uh, the Lord on the right hand of, of the Father and uh, coming in clouds of great glory and they had a dummy spit and stoned him to death. <laughs> and then from that, that, from that time forth, the message went to the Gentiles. So that was like, your 70 weeks is up. But during that 70 week prophecy, <laughs> it was mentioned that a prince would come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, therefore Jerusalem and the temple. And then, and then uh, it goes on about being spread with desolation. And this, <laughs> this is what happened in 70 AD. The Jews is the main, I mean, there were many, many Jews saved. On the day of Pentecost, right from the day one, there was 3,000 brought into, into the church, spirit-filled. And great revival happened amongst the Jews, but the, for the majority, they, 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 they neglected Christ. In fact, they killed him. And um, I want to look at it. We look at now, we're in the last days. Hey, we're around. We're around now. We read the Bible, it applies to us now. But I want to I put us in the position, what if we were first century Christians and how we would view things? And quite often I look at things in the scriptures like they have dual prophecy, dual meanings. And one example is that um, we're, we're very familiar when Paul said, you know, with, uh, with other tongues will he speak to these people. And therefore it's a sign to the unbeliever. And that's a quote from Isaiah. 
So Paul's saying that's what that means. It's speaking in tongues, being a sign to the unbeliever. But the original prophecy was about the Assyrians coming down and taking, taking Israel captive. And they would know it because there's going to be people in them. Yeah, they'll be ruled by people that don't understand their language. So this kind of dual meanings. And I, I think the first century or the 70 AD is a real eye-opener for what might be in store for the world at large later on. Um, we heard today about, um, you know, in our sister's testimony, wars, rumours of wars and so on. That also had application to those in the first century. In fact, probably more so, because during the Roman era, when they were alive, there was hundreds of years of peace. There were no wars, because they, they, they were the world. They, they controlled every nation. Nations paid them homage and so forth. There was this unparalleled time of peace. So at their time, when you start hearing about wars and rumours of wars, it's fresh. We, we read about famines and pestilences, and we, we don't even see it in the scriptures when we read it sometimes, but in Acts 11, we won't turn there, verses 27 to 30, it talks about a prophet arising amongst them, prophesying of a great dearth, therefore famine, that would come upon the land. We even read the scriptures where they're raising money to look after those people in Judea because of the famine. There was, there was great famines during their time after Christ died. There was earthquakes all over the place too, Syria and so, forth, so on and so forth. There was a lot of things happening. So if you're a first century Christian, <laughs> is what I'm saying, the 70 weeks prophecy, <laughs> 70 weeks, it's a time. It's a time limit. When you come to the end of the 70 weeks, when you come to the end of the time, then it's end times, isn't it? <laughs> like it is the end. They were, they, we know they said they were living in the end times. They were expecting an immediate uh, judgment. This generation will not pass away, so on and so forth. They really expecting a judgment to come. And we read everything as though in the scriptures, like it, in, we related to the second coming of the Lord. But there's a lot of scriptures. You, you go through the Old Testament, and I'll just quote one. Isaiah 19 verse 1 says, The burden of Egypt, behold... The Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt and the idols of Egypt shall be removed. That's an apocalyptic language, the Lord coming on clouds. No one saw God coming on clouds in the Old Testament. And there's lots like that. There's lots all the way through the Old Testament. It speaks of judgment. You know, when the Lord said, you'll see me coming in the clouds, that's judgment. Judgment. Judgment language. And so they were expecting this job. Even in Revelations, when we read to the letters to the churches, you know, repent or what? I'll come and remove your candlestick. Well, no one saw, you know, that wasn't talking about his second coming. He came and he removed the candlestick in judgment. So there's a lot of, you know, talk like that. So what I want to get at is this 70 AD was a very, very monumentous occasion that basically cut off permanently the Jews from the from the from the tree Judah as they did with 10 tribes of Israel and the tree still exists they can be grafted back in through Jesus Christ it's the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ grafted onto that original tree anyway I don't know how I'm going but <laughs> So imagine yourself, again, I just want to reiterate, imagine yourself in the first century and you're getting, because people think, oh, you know, the disciples wrong. They expected the Lord to return. They expected him to come. They were expecting the judgment. They, were, they knew in 70 AD, there wasn't one Christian killed. They all fled Jerusalem. You know, Jesus said, when you see the armies surround Jerusalem, get out. I mean, the historian is right. There wasn't one Christian killed during that time. They were warned. They knew what was coming. It was the last time. John, John said it's the last hour. He's obviously talk, not talking about something 2,000 years later. It's the last hour. They were talking about something that was going to happen in their generation. It was the return of the Lord. And again, duplicate prophecy. Look out. Things seem to be repeating in our time. In fact, 
I think why the Bible is so um, fitting for every single generation is because well, we even say history repeats itself. Yeah, nothing new under the sun. Mankind's just the same. Generation after generation after generation, repeating the same mistakes. So this viewpoint at this 70 weeks is the end times for that age, for that system, for that world. Let's start in Malachi 4. Malachi 4. Yeah, verse 1. I think I'll just wait for Rowan. <laughs> it's the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 4, verse 1. We read here, For behold, the day cometh. Another thing, we always read day of the Lord as the last, as the Lord's second coming as well. There's been many day of the Lord's in the Old Testament. Again, they speak of judgment. So the day cometh. Malachi 4, verse 1. That shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all they that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now, I'll just stop there for a sec. All the way through the Old Testament, there's warning about the tree being plucked up removed from the land. You know, this tree is talking about Israel. Thou shall leave them neither root nor branch. The day's coming where they shall be stubble. Verse 2, it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, that's Jesus Christ, with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember you the Lord Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children of their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I just pulled that scripture out because look, there's so many. It talks about Israel being a tree, Israel being a vine. We don't get it sometimes. We read the scripture. Jesus stood, Jesus stood up and said, I am the true vine. Do we get what he's saying? I'm the true Israel. Scriptures talk about calling my son out of Egypt. Everything he did, being in the wilderness and so forth. But he was Israel. I am the true vine. I'm the true Israel. I'm the, I'm the true tree. And he said, if any branch is not found in me, it's cast off, ready to be burned. He, you've got to be in that right tree. You've got to be in Jesus Christ. And he said, oh, let's go to Matthew 3 first. <coughs> Matthew chapter 3. You know, I haven't even covered what happened in 70 AD. It was horrific. 1.1 million Jews died, according to Josephus, the historian. They just went for about... Six years, they just went berserk. They're talking about they'll deliver you uh, in Matthew 24 about this you will be delivered up before governors and, and they'll persecute you and all this sort of stuff. Every apostle was persecuted and died except John. With Peter and well, James was was James was stoned to death by the Jews at, at some stage during this period, late in the period. Peter and Paul were both killed by Nero around 64, 66 AD. This is all in the lead up to 70 AD, right? And what happened is that 
for those familiar with Romans 1, basically about sin and the Lord said, oh, look, I'll just hand you over your sin, knock yourself out and you'll just be miserable and all this debauchery. That basically explains the lead up to 70 AD. The Jews went mad, basically. They turned on each other. They're killing each other. They broke up into factions. The zealots, look, Jerusalem was a great fortress. You couldn't penetrate Jerusalem. It was, it was an amazing, the, the, some of the walls, it took 20 blokes to open a gate. It was just an incredible, but, and there's all these famines. <coughs> Talk about wars and rumors. Well, there was one year they didn't even plant crops because they were too scared that there was a war coming, which didn't help with the starvation factor. The Celts wanted, wanted everyone to fight the Romans, so they, they destroyed all their food. The city, city of Jerusalem was divided into four camps, all led by four different people, and they're killing and murdering each other. There was all this garbage going on. There's so many riots, so many false prophets and, and, and whatnot, that the Roman, that forced the Romans to go down there. There was just so much you know, stuff happening. <laughs> and when the Romans surrounded them, remember the Lord said, when you see the city surrounded by, by armies, get out. <coughs> I mean, this guy goes down. I forget his name. I think it was Claudius. Anyway, he was the old man of Titus, right? There's all this strife starting to happen in Rome. They went through four emperors in, in a year. And this guy had sieged Jerusalem. But the Roman soldiers wanted him to be the wanted him to be emperor, so he was called back to Rome. So there was this reprieve, and he was he was made emperor. And then he sent his son Titus to finish the job in Jerusalem. But uh, Titus had to because uh, the other guy had retreated. He took quite a lot of the army with him. So Titus had to pick up, um, mer, mer, what do you call those? Mer, mercenaries. I was nearly there. So he's got this, this well-trained army, the Romans, but he's also got all these mercenaries who are only in it for the money. Anyway, so they come back and they surround Jerusalem. In that gap is when all the Christians, they saw it, they, they got out. They went to, to another place. But there's all this stuff going on. There's a report. They were so hungry. They were starving inside there. Josephus records a woman just roasting her child. <laughs> Which shocked even the army outside. So they, 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 they wanted the Jews to surrender. But inside they don't, like, you get murdered as well. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So that what happened there at one stage, some surrendered and they swallowed their gold. You know, we'll get it out later, clean it up type of thing good stuff but because they've been starving they fed them let them eat what they want and some of their stomachs burst open and what popped out gold but what did the mercenaries see gold so any jews that came out and surrendered were sliced open for their gold it was just it was just bloodshed it was bedlam it was horrible you know about obeying the lord i mean this is this is this is just like obstinance to the Lord. No, we're right. We're not following Jesus Christ. God is with us. Very similar things happening today. We're still rejecting Christ. It got so bad. I think, I think it was the day of Pentecost. Jews from all over that Roman world came to the city, surrounded by, surrounded by armies to go and do their sacrifices. And the Romans let them in. Unknown, unknown to these, these Jews going in. So this is why the city swelled up and why over one million people died. They just, despite seeing the armies, they still went in. Anyway. Unbeknownst to them, some guy had already killed all the priests and there was no, there was no sacrifice and everything going on. So they went in there and they, they would have been robbed and beaten and all the rest of it. And then the Romans would have been out, out again anyway. So they were just walking into a massive trap. It was just bedlam. It was just horrible. You cannot explain it. But 1.1 million people died. And it was so bad. In the, Jesus said not one stone will lay upon another. It was, it was rubble. It was dust. It was leveled. Completely. And you know what? All the way through in, in history, Titus didn't want this. He wanted to preserve the temple. 
that was God. He says, this is God's judgment. Like, like, he just, it was like he couldn't control it. Every time we try to do something, it all backfired and it ended in this massive, massive slaughter. The end result is, see, Jesus done away with all animal sacrifice and all the Old Testament system, but they continued to do so and say it was the right way. The destruction of the temple saw the destruction of all of their, their lifestyle. The temple was the center of everything, just not worship. All their genealogies were in the temple. No, it's not one person today can say, oh, I'm from the tribe of this and I'm from the tribe of that. Not one knows where they're from now. All that was wiped away. Because those things are not supposed to exist anymore. Even Jesus, when he cursed the fig tree, may not a leak, no fruit grow on you this day forever, from this time forward. There was judgment coming. And it, it was, but it was horrific. I'm going to have to pick up the pace. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, leavened girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. That's what we're having for lunch today. And then went out to him, and Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region round about, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Are we starting to get what the wrath to come was? 70 AD. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. When you come to the Lord, when you get baptized and filled with God's Holy Ghost, you become a child of Abraham. No natural descent gives anyone the right over anyone else. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Genealogies are no good for anyone. This next verse is what I wanted to call, pull out. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Then he says, I indeed baptize you with the water and unto repentance. But he comes after me, mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about, being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But he, all the way through the Old Testament, there's a warning about the tree being plucked up, rooted out, cut down. Here's John the Baptist. The axe is already laid unto the root of the tree. He's, he's telling you how it is. <coughs> and we also read, well, we didn't read, but Jesus is the true vine. I won't read the story, but there's a story that I... I'm running out of time, but in Luke 4, 16 to 30, if you want to read it later, interesting confrontation Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees. And they, they just, they lost it again. Very, very friendly people, these. They took him out to kill him. And they wanted to throw him headlong down the hill. They took him to the hill and wanted to throw him headlong down and kill him. Right? Other version says that hill is the valley. They wanted to take him out to the valley, throw him headlong and kill him. Remember that one for later. It's going to tie in what I'm going to cover now. I'm only covering one aspect of this talk. That's where I thought I'd get into this part. But I wanted to kill him. Matthew 21, verse 33. Matthew 21, verse 33. And you know, when you read, when you see the judgment to come, you can see, the, you see this in the parables, you can see it in so many things, so many scriptures in the Old Testament that 70 AD really marked the end of time as far as the Old Testament was concerned. It was officially done when Jesus was died on the cross and rose from the dead. But God, God said, you know, we are the temple of the living God. The temple of the living God is made up of lively stones, people filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. No other temple 
God wasn't going to allow any other temple to compete with his temple. People are still waiting for the temple to be rebuilt over there. I tell you what, if a temple is rebuilt over there and they reintroduce animal sacrifice, to me, that's the greatest abomination of desolation ever. Animal sacrifice instead of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice once and for all. But that temple has been rebuilt. Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I will build it again. He was talking about himself. He was talking about the church. All you lively stones. Look how lively we are. Yeah? Filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the temple of God. He doesn't dwell in temples made by men's hands. Anyway, where am I? Verse 33. Um, I've got to go down to verse 46. So, yeah, all of it. Here, another parable. There was a household, duh, <laughs> which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did it unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent to them his son, saying they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they say unto him, he will miserably destroy these wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. <laughs> I mean, he's talking about himself. He's talking about the prophets. They stoned every prophet. They killed every prophet. They were in charge of the vineyard. And their own mouths gave the judgment. He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out the vineyard to other husbandmen. It's the same vineyard that's been let out now to the church. Verse 42, Jesus said, Oh, and did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given unto a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, or a people bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's a church, the fruit of the spirit. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. We can fall on Jesus Christ. We can either fall on him and be broken ourselves, or we can fall under the stone and be crushed. No room for pride. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable, <laughs> they perceived he spoke of them. Oh, really? Aren't they clever? But when they sought to lay hands on him, here again, their first reaction is to kill him every time. He just, they just perceived he was talking about them wanting to kill him. And their first reaction, let's kill him. But they feared the multitude because they, so they didn't at that stage. Now, Jeremiah 19, nice story, interesting story. Jeremiah 19, back in the Old Testament. I said, there's so many directions I could go of this, so I just wanted to go this one because I found this very interesting. Jeremiah 19. The whole chapter just to make time constraints even harder. It's only 15 verses left. Thus saith the Lord. So this is Jeremiah prophesying. Go, oh well, this is the Lord talking to Jeremiah. Go and get a potter, potter's urban bottle. Take of the agents of the people and the and the agents of, of the priests. Go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom. Now remember, I talked about a valley earlier on, the one that chucking down. This is it. Go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate 
and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee. And say, hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever hear of his ears shall tingle, because they have forsaken me, and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. This is where Israel sacrificed children to different gods. This valley of Hinnom. This is why he said, this is why this prophecy is coming. You have shed the blood of the innocent. Think about it. This is God, these are supposed to be God's chosen people here. Who are killing their children. Mm, kind of happening now, isn't it? All around the world. <coughs> Maybe not as graphically for everyone to see like this, but it's still happening. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came into my mind. This is the Lord going, what are you doing? This, that, something like that would never even enter my mind. And they're burning children. A sac no wonder later on they ate them as well. Unbelievable. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet. Tophet. That's an important one too. I'm going to read. That's what I brought me my iPad. I'm going to read that out of the, um, uh, whatever it's called, Wikipedia. Nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. That's what this place was to be known as. It's the valley of slaughter. Same place where they wanted to toss. This is what they, this is where they, anyway, I'll get to that. This is where they wanted to toss the Lord head down, kill him. This valley of slaughter. It was a cursed place. And, and through history, after this, after this, the Jews knew it was a cursed place. It was a cursed place. It wasn't a place you wanted to go. Not a place you wanted to be buried. And I'll make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, right? This valley. In this place, I'll make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem. This gain ties into 70 AD. And I'll cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them to seek their lives. And their carcasses will I give to the meat of the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate. And a hissing. Everyone that pass thereby shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. That happened in 70 AD. And they shall eat every one of the flesh of their friend in the siege and the straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. And then shall they break the bottle in the sight of the men that do go with thee and shall say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Anyway, oh no, yeah, keep going. Even so I'll break this people, okay? This, this clay pot, he's breaking it in front of everybody and saying, and this is the Lord saying, even so I will break this people and this city. As one break of a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, it cannot be made whole again. The opposite of what we've been told these days. And they shall bury them in Tophet, in this valley. <laughs> Till there be no place to bury. 1.1 million. I'll give it away now. They were buried in Tophet. They couldn't, there was 1.1 million. They had, didn't know what to do. They filled up the valley. This place, this place. The son of Hinnom's, the place that was cursed. The place where they wanted to chuck our Lord.
Thus will I do to this place, saith the Lord, and to the inhabitants thereof, and even make this city as Tophet. The city was laid totally waste. And the houses of Jerusalem, the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled as the place of Tophet. We're getting the picture. <laughs> it, Jerusalem and the sanctuary are going to be like this cursed place, buried in Tophet, the place where you're killing children. I'll leave that one there. Let's finish. Matthew 23, verse 29. Matthew 23, verse 29. So knowing all these things were going to come, the judgment was going to come. And it's no different today. There's one escape, and that's through being born again in Jesus Christ. One escape. And I guess uh, today we're looking at the scary side of betraying the Lord, of being proud, of saying I'm godly without him. You know, this was upon the Jews back then. Things are sort of like situated almost exactly the same these days but it's the church is supposed to have god's word these days and how's the church going worldwide honestly it's graceful judgment begins at the household of god you know history is repeating itself matthew 23 verse 29 that's a chapter of woes especially if you're a scribe and a Pharisee. Verse 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Oh, sound like one of them old fire brimstone preachers. Now, remember that. Hell. I can't, I, I don't understand hell. I've got no idea. Most of the time it just means graves in the Bible. But this one, this one has a different meaning. I'll get to it in a minute. That I find amazing. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? Lock that one in. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. This they did to all the apostles. That upon you may come all, get this, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zachariah, son of Barachus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Upon this generation, all. The end of the 70 weeks, you see. This is the end. This is, this is the judgment of God. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord for these people. Upon you, it's going to come the blood of all these righteous people. I mean, I, I don't know. I just popped in my head revelations with martyrs saying, how long, Lord, how long? For just a short while. Well, here's all the martyrs, if you like, in one sense. How long you, before you avenge us? Gee, a lot tides into 70 AD. Verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, which I already read. Verse 36, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So we don't have to explain away that, oh, it's a generation that sees this, it's a generation that sees that. They could all fill in. But this generation, that were alive at Jesus' time, saw judgment. And they, they were the ones that copped the end of the 70-week prophecy. 
And then he goes, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets, stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Daniel chapter 9. That's how it finishes. Desolation. And then he finishes, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth. So you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then later on, they, they did that when he came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now, Tophet, right? We read about Tophet. We read about the valley of Hinnom, the son of Hinnom, where they did the animal sacrifice, where they sacrificed children, sorry. Let's have a look at this. The valley of Hinnom is first mentioned in the Hebrew Bible as part of the border between the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. You'll find that in Joshua 15, verse 8. During the late first temple period, it was the site of Tophet, the valley of Hinnom, Tophet. We already read that in Jeremiah, right? Where some of the kings of Judah had sacrificed their children by fire. Thereafter, it was cursed by the biblical prophet Jeremiah. We read that. Um, it's a valley uh, well the valley of Hidden, Hinnom is the modern Hebrew name for the valley surrounding the old city of Jerusalem so it's a valley there's a big pit the other name for it we read the damnation of hell that word from hell that we get the English translation hell from is Gehenna. Right? It's Gehenna. The other name for this valley is Gehenna. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Where they burnt their children, where they killed their children, where God said, This is where this you're going to be buried. This Tophet will be the be Jerusalem what we call hell, the damnation of hell, you will not escape the damnation of Gehenna, is what he said, literally. You will not escape the damnation of Gehenna. And that's where the 1.1 million were buried. They did not escape the damnation of Gehenna. They were buried in that valley. I mean, it was cursed. It became associated with divine punishment in Jewish apocalyptic <laughs> and is the destination of the wicked. So when he was telling them, talking to them of this, they knew that was the destination of the wicked. No one they wanted to kill him. You will not escape the destination of the wicked. And it was a place where, I can't see it here now, but it's where they, um, where they threw their dead animals and Anything that was uh, defiled, considered unrighteous. It was a place that was cursed. So we're seeing, you know, I, I guess that's a bit scary, but we're seeing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy there laid out. The judgment did come upon them in 70 AD. And here we are, like, you know, we don't have to get everything to fit in our time, if you know what I mean. But that doesn't mean things aren't going to happen, you know, in like manner. Like I said before, there's sometimes a dual prophecy. And whatever happens in the future, there's only one escape. Repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll hand over to Fred and I'll leave us through communion. We've got some musicians, have we, to lead us in a hymn? Yeah. <laughs>